Hello, ladies and gentlemen. And this, I think, is an illustration of the show must go on and how live theatre actually works. And one of the things that, of course, always happens when a show is about to open is that there are last minute bits and bobs. So thank you all for legging it across to the, uh, the main house. And you are very numbersome, but you look nice and discreet and intimate here. Um, you all know me. I think my name is Kate Moss. I'm a novelist and a playwright and the biographer of CFT. And you all know Jonathan Mumby, uh, not only the director of The Country Wife, which we're going to talk about now, um, um, and we are, of course, on Exile on the Chalk Garden set. The wonderful this is Chalk not Garden. the set for the country. Yeah, no. <laughs> it, it almost could be, though, if we got rid of the board games. Um, but you will also remember um, Jonathan's wonderful King Lear um, that was here last year. Uh, the biggest post-show uh, talk we ever had. Uh, but also, you might not know that Lear is about to open in London, which is wonderful. There will be an NT Live uh, broadcast of it, which means that Jonathan is doing Lear in the morning and country wife in the afternoon. Um, so there we go. But anyway, welcome, and you are awake. <laughs> yes, <laughs> whatever possessed you, Jonathan. <laughs> so I was going to start with very straightforward. You know, this is a play, 1675. It is one of the, the great restoration comedies. Um, why do you want to do a play that is that old and belongs to that period of time? And when you've decided to do it, how do you make it of now without in any way being disrespectful to the actual story and the actual characters and the actual language. Absolutely. Well, a lot of things there. You know, I, I've been fascinated by these post-Puritan plays for a while. Um, some of you may know uh, when Cromwell uh, overthrew the monarchy in this country, the theatres were shut in 1642. They weren't reopened. In fact, he cancelled not just theatre, but he cancelled Christmas too. Um, <laughs> and the theatres weren't opened until the monarchy was restored in 1660. That's a long time. That's a long time for this country to have no theater. And in that period, there's a whole generation of actors that have died. There's a whole generation that have been born who've never seen theater. Mm -hmm. So in 1660, something extraordinary happened. Yes, the monarchy was restored. Charles II came out of exile from France. What came with Charles was also a, a huge amount of aristocrats and, uh, and society. And with them came plays, poetry, uh, culture from the continent. And that's really what we see uh, reflected in these plays that were written. Uh, a huge dose of French and Spanish and Italian comedy. Uh, things that were being celebrated on the continent now being written by English playwrights for the first time. And celebrating things like women. Until the closure of theatres in 1642, it was illegal to have women on stage. Not now in the post-Puritan age. In 1660, women were allowed on stage for the first time. So you have these playwrights writing for, for now quite famous Actual women. Actual women, <laughs> not, not boys dressed as women and pretending. And what comes to that is a kind of celebration, not just of, of these amazing female characters, but also female sexuality as well. And uh, yes, in 1675, we have this uh, writer William Wycherley writing The Country Wife. Now William Wycherley was a member of the court, he knew the king, uh, he was a society figure, he had various affairs with quite famous actresses as well as with uh, some of the king's mistresses himself um, and uh, he writes this play The Country Wife uh, which is a pun in itself, I don't need to explain that to you <laughs> guys but it's... Not it's, at six o'clock you don't. No know. exactly that, <laughs> we need at least two gin and tonics before we can go there. Um, but here he is writing this play called The Country Wife, um, uh, which looks at not just male sexuality, but female sexuality as well. And, and also hypocrisy, male hypocrisy, female hypocrisy. What he's actually writing, what he actually is doing, I think, is holding a mirror up to the society uh, of the Restoration and reflecting it back at itself. He's saying to the audience that are coming to see these plays at Drury Lane in 1675, um, this is who you are warts and all, pox and all, I should say. This is your ugliness, this is your cruelty, this is your hypocrisy, this is how you get your kicks. This is life as we live it now. And one of the reasons why I was fascinated in these post-Puritan plays is that it feels like that Puritan age was like a kind of pressure cooker in terms of English society, that once Charles came back, um, the lid blew off and society erupted and all sorts of extraordinary things were happening. People, everyone was having sex with everybody, it felt like. You know, it was a great time of liberation. Um, and, 
and also people suffering the consequences of that. The, the outbreak of syphilis was a huge problem uh, in, in society London of, of the late 17th century to the point where it was quite common to see in the street people not just wearing white lead paint to cover pox marks, but also with people whose noses had fallen off. It's it was famous a, silver nose. Exactly it? that, yes. In fact, there's a famous character uh, of society at this time, uh, John Wilmot, second Earl of Rochester. Some of you may have come across him. He inspired a play by Stephen Jeffries called The Libertine, which is also made into a film. Was it John Malkovich, I think? Yes. Um, uh, Rochester, again a society figure, member uh, of the king's uh, inner circle, is the inspiration for uh, the male character, the male lead character in The Country Wife, and a character called Harry Horner. There's a clue in all of these names. <laughs> <laughs> One gin and tonic yeah, before exactly you explain that. Yeah, exactly that, Harry Horner. So Harry Horner in the play Country Wife is really um, a, a satire on uh, um, John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester. Uh, and who had syphilis, whose nose fell off, which was replaced with a silver piece of silver. I mean, grotesque and terrifying. Um, so look, coming back to your question of, of how do we, how and why are we interested in doing these plays now and how do we get an audience to engage with them? Well, when I read The Country Wife, this is years ago actually, um, I was struck by how modern it felt, by the fact that in all these hundreds of years since, we haven't changed really at all. We are still hypocrites. Uh, people still have affairs. Um, we still try and hide our shenanigans behind our loved ones' back. And I think even with the invention of um, social media, I think promiscuity is even more rife than it perhaps was even 10 years ago. And I'm interested in that. So I'm interested in this play reflecting who we are now and asking us, using the play to ask us some pretty tricky questions, I think, about, about who we are, what our morality is now, uh, and really, have we changed? Yeah. So one of the things that I, I found so glorious about it, I, I saw it last, last evening, was that all of those things you've just said, there is one modernising thing which we'll come to in a moment, but the language is his language. It's the language of 17th century Restoration London. Mm. Um, but everybody speaks it as if they are speaking like we are now. You know, there is a beauty in the language, and you've absolutely got that Great. out of everybody. Well, I'm really, I'm really glad you feel yeah. that, and it's what, something I'm adamant about. I think um, with all of these plays, it's about harnessing the language. It's about making sure that the actors are skilled enough to do it, but also um, have a rehearsal process where they have total ownership of the language. The language is everything in these plays. Um, you know, that's borrowed from the period before the theatres were closed. You know, we were in the golden age, really, of, of, um, of, of playwriting, you know, Shakespeare and his contemporaries, late Jacobean phase. Uh, some of that is held over. These plays are written in prose, not verse. Um, and actually, my actors find the prose uh, trickier to speak than the verse, interestingly. Do they? Yeah. Because there's no natural cadence. There's no, or, there's no yeah. rhythm to it. There's nothing, yeah. there is no, um, you don't have a playwright driving you. Yeah. It, prose, it does have a rhythm but you have to find it. And actually it's really taxed them, I can't tell you. <laughs> but we spent uh, weeks, we spent five weeks, a lot of time um, bashing through this text, unpicking it word for word, making sure that we have total ownership of it. And hopefully uh, in the use of it, it sounds like, yes, everyday language, but also the only words that that character can utter to express the thing that they're think thinking or feeling. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it becomes necessary. When you say you sort of unpick it, do you mean really quite literally, you know, somebody will say the line and you'll go, OK, so what do you think that means? Or oh, worse than that. Worse. I, I, painstakingly, <laughs> what I make them do is to paraphrase every single line. So right. to put every single line of text in their own words. It soon becomes oh. clear to me if they understand it or yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's But presumably that's the only way to make them inhabit the yeah. storytelling. Because totally. it, it is a, a, a ripping along story in the end, isn't it? It is, it is, it is. And, and actually one of the reasons why I, I've loved it, this play for so long is that it's great sitcom. It's situation comedy at its best. Mm -hmm. It's great farce. It's a sex farce at times. Um, the, it, it, but only, you can only get to that point, which is all about rhythm and pace and, you know, what farces are like, you know, in terms of the energy that you need. You can only get to that place once you've 
harness the language. So the process started with the language whilst we were working with a brilliant movement director, Charlie Broom, on the physical life of the show too and, and how it might work on, on stage. And just to go back to how, how we've set it, I, I, I was going to set it in period at one point, hoping that the audience would see themselves reflected in the periodness of the production. But actually, I, I really felt uh, the more I worked on it that it was the, it was the wrong decision. So we've modernised it. We're now in a contemporary context for the play. And, and I, I think it's incredibly liberating. The cast were liberated by the idea. We were all liberated. Um, we hold on to the language. Uh, uh, you get every word of William Wycherley's play, pretty much. But, uh, but it's now in a context and in modern dress. It's Except it's not... Sorry to interrupt and yeah. tell you. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it's not modern dress in terms of jeans and all the rest. There, there is a stylistic a decision sure. about it. I mean, and, and, I, and I say and contemporary context. It, it, and for those of you who've seen, you know, my work before, what, what I love to create is a is a kind of unique hybrid world, a world that might look and feel familiar, but it's its own world. It really is a hybrid, this, uh, the world that we've created on stage between the contemporary and the, and, and, and the past. So, so it's about borrowing from the past and bringing it into the present. So for example, there's a um, uh, Sir Jasper Fidget, a character in the play who is an MP, um, has a dispatch box, and instead of ER on it, uh, it's CR, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so it's Charles, it's, you know, the, the reigning monarch in the world of the country wife is Charles II. Uh, so it's a hybrid. We borrow from the past and bring it into the present. It really is trying to make it feel as immediate uh, for a contemporary audience as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and I'm afraid Horner and his friends, as they maraud about, you know, it, yeah. they are lads, lads, lads. They are. I mean, that's how they behave. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They, are, they, yeah. would have, they would have been in, you know, if we were in period, but it just, I, I see my brother and his friends. In the, <laughs> so I got to wonder. Don't put that on Twitter, anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I had to suffer the stag do a couple of, <laughs> I'm still in recovery. Um, uh, so it's, you know, it's about, it's about, uh, about embracing that and, um, uh, yeah, and allowing an audience to, uh, to see it. You know, there's, there's, William Witchley, when he wrote, when he had the play published, and it was published in his lifetime, interestingly, um, he, he quotes um, Horace, um, a bit of uh, Latin at the beginning of the play. And, you know, it became for me a, a kind of rallying cry. And, and he, 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 this is the legend that he had printed at the beginning of the play. He says, it disgusts me that anyone should find fault with something, not because of its composition is crude or lacks elegance, but simply because it is modern. He was, he, was, he was very aware that he was writing something cutting edge and modern at the time. And he was frustrated with criticism for just doing, being modern. I think there was a thirst at the time to revive ancient plays, you know, plays from the pe previous period. He was a cutting edge playwright. And I, I wanted to honor him yeah. in, in some way and say to a, to, a, to a modern audience, this is also us. We can also be daring and modern with this too. And one of the things um, that I'm very mindful that you're going in, so we're, we've agreed the things we're not going to do to spoil anything. Um, but I think it's very important, the thing you said earlier about women's sexuality as well. Mm. And there is one character who is violent and unpleasant, yeah, yeah. or potentially so. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yes, and yes, he yes. seems out of step as well. Yeah is what I felt you'd try to do with that, because that's Absolutely. a complicated storyline. It that really bit. is complicated. And we're talking about the country wife, Marjorie Pinchwife, and her husband, um, Jack Pinchwife. <laughs> and, you know, there, there are fantastic clues in all of these names. You know, Pinchwife can mean physically pinching his wife and tormenting her. It could also mean pinching somebody else's wife. Um, it, means, it, means, it means several things, I think. Um, but he, yes, he is violent towards his wife. And those moments of violence, I think in the original productions of this play uh, in, in the 17th century would have been played for laughs. I think that the audience would, perhaps would have found it funny when uh, Pinchwife turns to his wife and says, do what I ask you to do, or I will write whore in your face with this knife. Now there is no way of us doing that now uh, uh, without playing that for the reality of it, you know, and playing her fear for the reality of it. And what I, I and I love these moments in the in the production that we've got. It suddenly chills the audience, and uh, and feel guilty about laughing and feel the guilty about laughing. before. Absolutely, yeah. and the brilliance of the writing and the brilliance of my actors is that we have the audience laughing five lines later. 
uh, and enjoying themselves again. Uh, and I, I, I love that, you know, I, I love the realities of it. It's also about daring to look at Harry Horner, the character, and uh, asking ourselves some kind of tricky questions in terms of his sexuality. Why is this man having sex with half of London? What is driving him? You know, he's addicted to sex. He's a sex addict. What is the reality of that? You know, the, the last couple of lines of the play are really interesting. They describe uh, the character of Horner uh, about what it's costing him. Um, uh, to do what he does, he says, ends up with um, his male friends despising him. This man who is having sex with half of London is also uh, pissing off his male friends. What he ends up with, actually, is nobody, ultimately. He ends up lonely. And again, w what I've tried to do is to sort of pull the ro rug from underneath the audience's feet at the end of the play and, and ask them to, to uh, acknowledge that in some way. But it's a wonderful way that you've bookended with the the scene at the beginning and at the end, mm. and there is a plangency at the end and a sadness, yeah. and yeah. you feel also yeah. Yeah. serves you right, actually, yes. is what Absolutely. I feel. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> you know. he's Weinstein, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and at some point, uh, um, uh, life catches up with you. Yeah. So one of the things about the modernizing, mm. when you had made that decision, how far into the process was it? Was that all before you were in the room with your yeah, company? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was, and it had to be because uh, with five weeks rehearsal to create the design, the set, and all of the costumes, which are very intricate and detailed, takes that time. So, it t it, it, so I, yeah, I needed to do all of that creative thinking uh, weeks before we got anywhere near the rehearsal room. And is it something when actors come in to audition or you have asked particular people to come in to, to read, do they ask that question? You know, if oh, you say, absolutely. do they say, you know, am I going to be in absolutely. Brussels and stuff? And you know what? There wasn't a single actor that was excited by the idea of doing it in period. Not a single one was interested in doing that. A, a lot of the actors felt that it would just be irrelevant, that it would be about a a then and there, as, a, as opposed to a here and now. Um, I mean, they, they knew me and knew my work and knew that we would absolutely investigate uh, um, not just uh, uh, the language, but the period in detail, and we would have a great understanding of where the play comes from and respect for it. But what they wanted to do was to wear clothes that felt familiar. What they wanted to do was be able to behave in a familiar way. We don't really know what a gallant libertine acted like in 1675 we'd be we'd be making it up and it would be false it would be a lie we know exactly what the libertines of our society now act like you know i've cast some of them <laughs> <laughs> and you've been on stag do's with others like <laughs> exactly um, but that. What, one of the things about your to your point about uh, the contemporary echoes you know the way echoes in history go backwards and forwards i do think it's very amusing that the jokes that are often about, oh, yes, well, it's French, you know, they're from France, they still land exactly the same three, four hundred years later. You know, the audience falls yeah. about at that sort of moment. Oh, gosh. Um, yes. Do you, when you're, when you're, I know, you, you know, your reputation absolutely and the nature of your work, do you make decisions about cutting or paring down text at all? Or do you decide that if you're, you're going to do it justice, you must do it as it was written? Mm, that's interesting. I, I think we have an unhealthy re relationship with text sometimes these days, that we put these classical plays in a box marked sacred that can't be tampered with in any way. And that's very unhealthy and also unrealistic in terms of the relationship that those writers would have had with their own work at the time. We know that when Shakespeare was writing, he uh, he continuously rewrote, you know, I'm, I'm back in the rehearsal room with King Lear. And we know that from the quarto edition that was published in Shakespeare's lifetime, a couple of years after the first performance, to the published edition after his death in 1623, there are m huge changes. So that we know that he, he continued to revise the play and revise the play. So, so locking these plays down and saying there's a, there's a, it's a fixed point is ridiculous. It absolutely is, is about the moment of performance. These are performance texts. And so I, when I start to work on a, on a play, usually six months before I go into the rehearsal room, uh, uh, I'm forensic, yes, but I'm also really tough on myself and tough in terms of an audience's ear. Uh, I, I don't want anything in there that the, that the audience are gonna really have to fight to understand. I mean, that's not to say that the play isn't difficult, it is, and you have to listen, and you, you have to have your wits about you. 
um, and I'm not going to dumb it down at all, but if there are s period references in there that are really specific that an audience simply won't get, it's pointless at being there. Also, our, the, the, the way that we go and see plays nowadays is very different from way back then. When the original audience went to see The Country Wife, the play would have started at 2.30 in the afternoon and would have finished at around 6.30, you know, 7 o'clock. It's an entire afternoon of entertainment. Each act, five acts, with um, performance between each one, songs, dances, juggling acts between each act, which means that each act also has a lot of repetition because there'd be some so audience members well, yeah, who, would, yeah. who would miss an act, miss yeah. an entire act, or who would be having sex in the back stairs with an orange seller. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're going to miss vital piece, now, of, <laughs> <laughs> vital piece of information. So there's a huge amount of repetition that the writers wrote into the plays that is now completely unnecessary. That's so interesting. And so, so all that can go. And would you, or have you indeed, cut particular scenes if you feel in the end they mm. are claggy and they're kind of holding the play back? from yeah. Because the pace, I thought, was amazing last night. Great. Yes. And that, you know, that's, that's come from, uh, you know, I've made some cuts since we, since we opened to previews last week, actually. Oh. <laughs> Two, in fact, one almost entire scene is gone. How do the actors cope with that when they say... They can feel it, you know? Yeah. I, I, it's interesting. They know. I, it's, they know. I, yeah. it's rare, actually, that I present a cut to a group of actors and it's not em embraced because they, they feel it. And the great thing about being in uh, this space, but also with the, in, in the Minerva, is that they are, have a great awareness of the audience because they, they can see the audience. They know if an audience is listening or not, or bored or not, or with it or not. And, uh, yeah, there was a section that opened the final scene of the play uh, where the narrative stopped and uh, a, a song happened and, um, and, the, and, the, and the evening just ground to a halt. And it went. Was it one person's absolute moment in the sun? Oh, it was, wasn't it? Oh, no. And you look so nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but actually, yeah. I mean, you, d just on, to that point, you mentioned earlier the movement and you've just mentioned about yeah. the song. There, you know, yeah. there is strong and powerful music and strong and powerful yes, movement yes. rather than dancing. Yeah. Um, that seemed to me, again, a really wonderful way of suggesting that they were all filling their worlds with so much noise and, you know, mm. in order to not really think. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of... Um, uh, displacement, but also denial, perhaps avoidance going on in this time, pleasure seeking. You know, I think it's interesting that Witcherly writes a dance uh, into the end of the play, which we've absolutely staged and, and found a, you know, m fun modern equivalent of. It's a dance of, he calls it a dance of cuckolds. Uh, um, uh, and Charles II at the second performance of The Country Wife got on stage and danced with the actors. Uh, you know, it's a, absolutely a time of, of uh, uh, liberation and celebration uh, and, um, and actually trying to ignore possibly the realities of what's but going sad, on. But sad, the one character, The Country Wife, that's very moving. She's very moving. I, again, I don't think it would have been played like that originally. It's, a, it's about us... Uh, um, as a group of people in the, in, the, you know, in the present tense coming to meet this play and actually seeing, um, yes, us reflected back, but also really investigating these as real people in a real situation. You know, I directed Twelfth Night a few years ago and the end of that play has always struck me as very sad. I mean, are, the, are, the, did the, are, those, are those happy couples at the end of that story? Do people really get what they want? Look at Malvolio's story, look at the tragedy of that. You know, if you dare to investigate this on real terms, as it were, yeah. I think actually you're in for a much more satisfying evening because it reflects life. Life is very funny and also very sad. And I think, uh, and I think if you're daring to investigate these things and present a slice of life, then you, you have a duty actually to, to investigate it on real terms. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that Alan Strachan, the director of the Chalk Garden, for those of you who came to my interview with him, he was talking about that odd moment that when you put a comedy before the audience mm. and sometimes they are silent, it's a tumbleweed moment at the thing that you all thought was hilarious mm. and it doesn't land with the audience. And then other times they're laughing at moments that you didn't think were amusing at all nor were intended to be. Have you had any of that? I mean, and if so, how do you negotiate that? Do you change delivery or do you just believe next night's audience will yeah. be sharper? <laughs> no, I think uh, I, um, with any play like this, previews are absolutely essential and we worked our socks off um, listening to an audience. The, the audience tell you everything. 
uh, and with a play that has so many asides. Does everyone know what I mean by an aside? It's, it's when a character who's in a scene turns out to the audience and breaks the fourth wall and says, actually, what I'm really thinking is this. And then going back into the and scene again. And you found again. a way of marking that. We found a way, yeah. various ways of marking that. That's been a kind of negotiation, <laughs> you know, for the last few weeks. No, we found a way of doing that. But also, because there's direct address with the audience, because there's an awareness of the audience being there. And, you know, don't forget that when these plays were first performed, the audience were as lit as the actors on stage. They were in shared light, as the Shakespeare's globe new phrase, yes. mode du jour. Yes. Um, they were in shared light. So uh, uh, th there's no escaping the audience's presence. They are part of it. In fact, I would even suggest that the, that the audience are the 16th character of the play. Uh, and so to not get that character until, you know, the end of the rehearsal period, as it were, is terrifying. Yeah. But it means also our learning curve is almost vertical. You know, I listen to the audience on the first preview um, and I, you know, fill a notebook with notes that then we then go into rehearsal the next day and have to work through. And in terms of getting the laugh, you know, uh, it's a science. You're not going to get a laugh if, the, uh, if the, actually the audience don't hear it or perhaps don't see it. It's about clearing space. It's also about stillness as well. If somebody else on stage is moving whilst there's a line that is a punchline to something, you will never get the laugh because the audience are distracted by something else. It's a real science. And it's about the company as actors knowing that and understanding that uh, and, and working with the audience to kind of deliver it and also deliver Witchley's intention as well, yeah. I mean, as you can probably tell, I thought it was absolutely fabulous. I studied this play at university and I liked it so much that I'm actually going to go and see it again tomorrow. Um, because I felt there were so many things that I probably were, was missing because I was looking over there when something was happening there. Um, we're going to have time for a few um, audience questions. Anna is poised with the, with the microphone. Does anybody have a question? Gentlemen, right up the back. Uh, um, first of all, good evening, Jonathan, and uh, welcome and greetings from your many fans in Cringleford and Saxlingham Nethergate. What? <laughs> <laughs> my, that's where my parents live. Yeah. <laughs> and, my, and my brother. <laughs> nothing, will, nothing will get back to them. <laughs> um, what I was interested in is, is how a play like this comes into being. I mean, you, you started off by saying that you, you read it, you were always interested in it. So do you then have to find... Uh, a theatre that wants to put it on, or does it work the other way around, that somebody thinks, I want to do The Country Wife, and they cast around for a director? It, it can, uh, programming, works, programming works in many different ways. Uh, sometimes an artistic director will have an idea about what they want to see on their stages in a season and invite directors to come and do those plays, or they, you have a conversation with them and they say, what do you want to do? And actually, uh, uh, in all honesty, uh, we were going, I was going to do another play. In this in this slot, but um, it was Ooh, now. Of course, I can I see can, you don't want to say. Can't tell you. No, absolutely <laughs> not. It might rear its head at some point yeah. in the future, <laughs> which is entirely about casting. And I, we, I didn't get the actress that I wanted, um, and so I, we, 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 Daniel and I and, and Rachel, we both, we all felt that it would be a waste to uh, um, do that play, that other play, without the cast that we all w believed in a hundred percent. So Daniel asked me what other titles I was interested in. He had some ideas too. And I said, look, I've always wanted to do The Country Wife. And he said, OK, let me read it. Um, and he read it and he loved it as much as I did. And, and he said, well, why do you want to do it? And I said, I want to do it for these reasons. And, um, uh, he, and he got it. He got what I wanted to do with it. And so that's how The Country Wife came to be. You know, that, and then we had the kind of, because we had then a shorter time in terms of uh, before the famous Chichester Festival Theatre brochure was uh, uh, finalised and published, which is, you know, a looming deadline, was also about then finding uh, actors to play these roles. Because it's, yes, it's called The Country Wife, and you need an extraordinary actress to play Marjorie Pinchwife, and we have one in Susanna, Susanna Fielding, Fielding is, is incredible. You also need a great Harry Horn, and we've got Lex Shrapnel, who is also fantastic. But it's not just about, you need a great leading actor in, in almost all of these roles uh, in this play. They all need to be brilliant. So we, we went at it hard and fast to get the ca cast of our dreams, and I've ended up with- It is an astonishing company. An amazing cast, yeah. 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 Brilliant. Duffy. Yes, I'm intrigued because you said that, the, as you say, that the theatre came to a full stop, nothing, nothing. And then it was like the lid blowing off. 
do you think that's why plays like this were then written? Would it, how different could it have been if there had not been any stoppage there? Yes. Well, Thank it, you. Good question. It's a really Thank good you. question. Uh, this play, The Country Wife, uh, feels to me like uh, it could have been written by Molière. <coughs> yes. I, think, I think you see very much the French influence on, on, on these plays. You know, there are other plays of the Restoration that feel like Calderon from, from Spain and, and from Gold, you know, and Goldoni too, from Italy. And I think you see very much the European influence. These boulevard farce sex comedies that are absolutely from a society. Uh, um, I, who knows where our English playwrights would have gone uh, 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 if Cromwell hadn't overthrown the monarchy. I have no idea. I, I think the Restoration feels, has always felt to me, although it reflects who we are and, it's, it, and opens up very universal questions and has universal themes in it, it is also quite narrow still, actually. It was really writing for quite a small section of society, a small group of people. Those theatres were very small. Uh, these writers were writing to speak to a, quite a close-knit group. There's a lot of in-jokes in there. They speak beyond that, and the reason why these plays are still in the repertoire says something about their universality, but, but actually they're quite narrow also. What was happening in, in Shakespeare's time and, 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 and after him in the sort of late Jacobean and you know, those later, later years was something much more expansive, it was much more about reflecting a fuller society. And that's, that's the tragedy of, 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 of the, the deposition of the monarchy and, and Cromwell, the Cromwell age, yeah. Um, I haven't seen a, as it were, a proper performance, but <laughs> I saw the uh, dress rehearsal last week as, as a commissioning circle member. And I must say, I, I'm glad Kate meant, ra raised the question of the costume because I was very puzzled. Um, you say you didn't set it in Renaissance and you didn't set it in, in modern dress, which is absolutely correct as one saw it. So I wonder, in that case, what is your basis for deciding what people wear. You haven't got any sort of starting point. Do you understand what I mean? Well, the starting, yeah, good. Uh, um, the starting point is character. Uh, the starting point is character and using points of reference that a contemporary audience would recognize, really. I mean, we play a trick on the audience and, uh, well, I'm not gonna spoil it for you. There's a, there's a, there's a sort of uh, an ironic nod to the 17th century at the end of the yes. show, which you won't have seen yet, because that was added after we opened. Uh, so you've got that to look forward to if you come back. Um, but it's it, the work that, that I do, and work certainly that designers like Sutra Gilmore, our brilliant designer for Country Wife does, is, is absolutely about character. Uh, our understanding of, <coughs> of fashion over the last, I don't know, 50 years, but, but, but character. If the character existed today, what would they wear? And it's about looking at that, understanding that, but also then bringing in a flavour of period two. You know, I think comedies like this is all about uh, truth and reality, uh, like a situation comedy is, but to a point. At some point you need to loosen the screws and allow it to breathe and to play, and to be playful, actually. I would say the starting point is character. And there are, there are nods to the 17th century in various pieces of clothing. There are. Which are, yes, yeah. which were very satisfying when you spot them. I think. Yeah, yeah, and exactly There's a sort that. of ludic quality with it. Gentlemen there, thank you. Well, thanks very much. Um, so I can't wait to see it tonight now. So. Um, you, you said something which just sort of blew me away, and you talked about this play coming at the end of the period of um, Cromwell, and the lid was blown off. So I get the feeling there's, there's something about rebellion and let the corsets go and, and and of course this was the time when the Royal Society was founded and the motto of the Royal Society was nullus in verbia which is take nobody's word for it so I just want <laughs> <laughs> I just get the feeling there's a yeah. sort of an atmosphere building yes indeed. at this period yes and I think you're you're, you're absolutely right uh, um, it's 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 restoration on, on on so many levels you know restoration is a metaphor actually uh, uh, for what, what this period is um, uh, uh, of vibrancy and fun and libertinism, yeah. I, I do have a look at the libertine um, 
uh, if you get a chance, uh, that the film is available or, or read the play by Stephen Jeffries. There's an inc- extraordinary opening speech in that play where the character of John Wilmot, Earl, second Earl of Rochester, comes on stage, confronts the audience and says, you will not like me. <laughs> and it's an extraordinary way to start, a, to start an evening. And it's a risk for a writer, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we have an, a very similar ambivalent relationship with, uh, with Harry Horner. And some of you may know a play called The Man of Mode uh, by, uh, by Etheridge. I think it is, yes. Man of Mode has a character in it called uh, um, Dormant, again based on Rochester. Um, and we do have a love-hate relationship with these characters at the centre. We kind of want them to get away with it. We also want them to get their comeuppance as well. And I think that's part of what this age is. And, yeah. and here, many of this audience will have seen in the 50th anniversary year in 2012, um, the April De Angelis, uh play Playhouse Creatures, ah, yeah, of which course. was wonderful and was here in, yeah. when we had theatre on the fly. Final yeah. question from you, Greg. Hi, hi, Jonathan. It's great to have you back here at Chichester. Um, can I ask a, uh, maybe a slightly cheeky question, which is, um, how do you think Mrs. St. Maum and her family in the Chalk Garden would cope with Harry Horner and his friends turning up? <laughs> <laughs> have you read the Chalk Garden? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know the Chalk Garden. Um, uh, oh, gosh. Uh, uh, <laughs> indigestion? <laughs> Oh, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> um, now, on, on that point, I need to bring it to an end. Um, thank you all so much for your forbearance coming across. Jonathan, I know it's very hard opening a new show and doing all of those things, so thank you for literally running between the buildings to Pleasure. do this Pleasure. and running back. Um, there will be a post-show on the 27th of June, which will be in the Minerva. It won't be me, I'm afraid, doing that, but it will be happening with members of the company. I will be back on this stage on the 5th of July um, with my tap shoes on, obviously, for interviewing Daniel Evans uh, for me and my girl. But for now, can we just say thank you to everybody in the company here in the Festival Theatre who made us welcome, to everybody who's working hard over there, but particularly, and best of luck for tomorrow's night, Jonathan Mumby. Thank you.